so we're back. Um, we had made it to, to the declaration for, for this session. We'll just uh, play this one by ear. But I wanted to talk a little bit about American constitutionalism then as, as the next step, uh, and then do a fair amount of uh, discussion as time allows. So if people wanted to give people that chance to even go back to Montesquieu if we want. Um, we looked at the Federalist Papers. We looked at John Witherspoon. So I really want to you know, have an opportunity to talk through those for those documents as well. Um, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back, and we'll, t we'll talk about the French Revolution. So the point about constitutionalism, uh, here's ending the war at the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, peace Treaty of Science, 1783. Um, I always like to point out that the, the British were too, you know, too busy to actually sit for the official painting. Um, but then what happens next, right? So independence is declared, and we, we, we're claiming it's kind of a, this mixed founding. How, how do you then make a country a, a stable country? What shape does this newly independent country look like? Um, and here I think what the Americans do is, is significant because they aim to, uh, you know, first of all, they're building on this habit of self-government. They know the pattern of constitutions and constitutionalism, and so they're going to continue to put that into practice. It's just a matter of how to do it. Um, so they, so the, the style of American revolution is not one of Revolution means overthrowing everything, right? Revolution is we've changed governance. Now we need a system to embody that liberty. And I think that's, that's really different from subsequent other revolutions, right? What sets the Americans apart from others? One is it was not a revolution in favor of unfettered license. It was a revolution in favor of a new form of liberty, and that, and that matters. So you'll note the the Political debates don't lead to massacres, to expulsions, but it gets, they get channeled into a, a constitutional framework. The first attempt are the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they're drafted shortly after independence, but go into effect 1781. Um, and I think here the, the key thing to note is it's a confederation, not a nation. Right, um, the thirteen plural states agree to work together for some things, right? Especially foreign affairs, but little else, right? The Articles do not create a national structure as much as a, a superstructure, um, and because of that, the, the national government is doing very little, right? You know, about and um, there are still some advocates for the Articles of Confederation. One of my, one of my friends just posted a blog post. He said, three cheers for the Articles of Confederation, right? Very decentralized, not a nationalist model. Um, what are some of those weaknesses? Uh, there was no permanent taxing power uh, for, the, for the Confederation government. All they could do was request money from the states. That worked out as well as you would probably expect it to work out, right? Dear New Hampshire, can we have you know, this much money in taxes? Well, maybe, if, if, we, if we deign to do that. Um, many decisions were not majority, but required supermajorities, which hindered uh, decision making. Um, further, if you actually saw a problem with the articles and you wanted to amend them, amendment had to be unanimous, which really gets in the way of making decisions. And on several amendments, they were defeated 12 to 1. And the holdout in those cases, in each case, was Rhode Island. So thank you, Rhode Island. <laughs> right. Uh, for blocking the articles becoming more effective. So 
the Confederation government is pretty weak, um, inefficient, it doesn't do much, and in that kind of lack of orderly structure, you see increased upheaval in the states, right? So that where, where the problems are felt is in the states. So uh, the Pennsylvania governmental system is shaky. Uh, in Massachusetts, there's actually an uprising called Shays Rebellion, which many people point to as, as a real problem. So from this, uh, we get a push for a new uh, constitutional government. Um, among people who have, again, more of a national vision, people like Madison, there's a young Madison, and Alexander Hamilton. Um, incidentally, if we're going to talk the Hamilton musical, we can do that later. Uh, I'm game. Um, but the sense that we that some reform is needed, that the articles are so bad they need to be replaced, and so there's a then a you know stages of development. The first attempt is at the Annapolis Convention, uh, held 1786. The call goes out. Let's talk about the articles. However, not all the states arrive. In fact, only about five states have arrived. By their, five, seven states have arrived by the time uh, the meeting is supposed to begin. So it doesn't succeed, they don't do anything. Uh, several other states actually show up after the meeting has disbanded. I was thinking, what would that have been like? Hey, well, guys, we're here, sorry it took us so long. Yeah, they left town two weeks ago. But the one thing Annapolis does do is it issues a formal call for a new convention the next year. Right, to be held in Philadelphia, 1787. And there's a historical painting with George Washington uh, in, in the chair as the chairman, uh, or as, as chairman, and that, that really proves to be extremely important. Uh, I don't think I want to linger too long about the, you know, the details of, of the convention. You know, the, people often talk about it as this threefold uh, dialectic. Uh, Madison brings the Virginia plan, which favors the large states. Uh, he's, uh, he's answered by the New Jersey plan, which favors the small states. And uh, they finally settle their differences in a great compromise, actually worked by Connecticut, uh, which will uh, have a bicameral Congress Senate and House. The House is responsive to the populations, favors the large states. The Senate ensures that each state gets two votes. Okay. Um, actually, tangent on, on that note, right? We're talking about the Electoral College. I've also now seen complaints against the Senate, right? How dare Montana have two votes in the Senate, right? Especially if they send people that we don't like, right? This is unequal. So again, where does that come from? It comes from not understanding the, the logic of the Senate, right? So if you have one singular principle, you can question a lot of things in the American regime. So understanding the, the construction actually really matters. So as far as constitutional um, principles, the one thing I want to, to just highlight here uh, comes from the historian Forrest MacDonald, but he says, what are some of the concerns, what are some of the impulses shaping American constitutionalism again? Well, he says they want to carry over the, the best ideals of English common law, right? Life, liberty, property. Um, people say, oh, the Lockean trifecta, right? Uh, the life, liberty, property. There's a conviction that it has to be Republican government, right? So no one's really going to take Hamilton's call for a monarch too seriously. It has to be Republican, but what, what shape will Republicanism take, right? There could be multiple Republicanisms. There's a commitment to uh, being informed by history. Um, there's influence of political theory, and this is a point where I'd say the uh, in the constitution-making period, the figure who is cited most often is not Locke, 
It's Montesquieu, right? So people talk about a Madisonian moment. I dare even say there's a Montesquieuian moment here in the constitutional era. Brian, looks like yeah. you want to jump in. Yeah, just uh, the um, beginning of the Montesquieu reading. Yeah. He's talking about law, this metaphysical law, and it sounds like Aquinas. It sounds traditional. So when people come up with the Patrick Deneen thesis about Lockean revolution, this kind of stuff, are they really skimming over how much Montesquieu had an influence and how the kind, like you said, the four kinds, I mean, and you can break it down in even more specific ways. Uh, do you think they, they can't see that there's multiple enlightenments, Montesquieu is one component, and it's much more traditional than what the, this sort of neo-reactionary, whatever fervor is saying? Right. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And, and that's one reason why I exhibit these sections, mm -hmm. too, is I was, I've been struck by that in, in Montesquieu. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's not going to make a big deal of it. He's not going to like yeah, offer like, that, yeah. that, that complicated breakdown of, of natural. But it is still rooted yeah. in a divine creation and that human law is related to divine law. Yeah, uh, to answer your question off of that, so these empiricists are really big on science, but if they're strictly empiricists, how do they get to laws, metaphysical laws of nature? That's kind of, oh, I bet. I, well, I think it's a complicated question, but <laughs> that's kind of, that, that could be an assumption. I'm sorry, it's like the cosmos <laughs> system and, and positivism. All right. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll make a phone appointment later. You, 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 guys, you guys figure that out. Um, but it, it is a it is a difficulty, right? How do you go from data to to a law, right? Um, especially if you're breaking down any kind of traditional understandings, right? Where you know, for Thomas again, he's he's a lot of it is a, is a given, right? It's already recognized. He's just articulating it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're saying we're starting from scratch, what if we don't have any background? How do we come to a, some sort of natural law? Then it's a very different yeah. different story. So, um, so Montesquieu, and then, but beyond the theory, um, again, uh, Forrest McDonald points out that experience actually plays a large role too, right? That what makes the Constitutional Convention successful are the fact that these are practical people who are thinking about uh, how it has worked well previously and what has not worked well in the states, in other countries, in other regimes, and bringing all of that to bear on the Constitution. So we should identify it's not only the theory, it's kind of the embodiment and practical steps. Um, so we should keep that. What's the genius of American constitutionalism? Practi part of it is practical means to desired ends, practical wisdom. Oh, wait a minute, that's the virtue of prudence, right? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Uh, theoretic, philosophical prudence, uh, wisdom in action. Okay, so I, I did want to work that in before we went further. Um, but beyond that, uh, to say we have a lot of reading, so if Brian wants to take us back to Montesquieu, um, we have John Witherspoon, and then for this section, we also had Madison and the Federalist papers, which point to the ratification debates. We can go, we can go there too. So, uh, but let's let's just take the time to sort sort through these ideas and, and see either I can say what what do people want to talk about, or I can I can guide us through. But I wanted to give give people that that opportunity first of all. Yes, uh, so the uh, reading, and I just kind of wanted to ask. Uh, I want to hold off on Dwight. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Sorry. I thought you were addressing all the reasons. Yeah, we can stick with Anything that. but that, but not that gotcha. one. Okay. Yeah. Let's start with Montesquieu, right? Because that actually, we said Montesquieu, earlier French Enlightenment, but, but why is he so important, especially in the Constitution-making period? So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's just ask, right, how... What is, what is his view, not only of law, but then of how law should operate, right? Because by the end, you have some application going on.
Well, uh, this is page 31 in the, on the PDF. In the second, beginning of the second paragraph, he talks about the minds of people being enlightened. Um, and then about the magistrates and their prejudices. So it seems, again, he's not some radical trying to instigate these new revolutionary ideas in the minds of the people. But he gives this very traditional account of natural law and just says it, it ought to be that people understand this when forming government. Um, yeah, that this can be an improvement and an informed citizenry mm -hmm. will hold the magistrates accountable. Yeah. So again, you're, you're balancing the interests of, of the, the rulers with, with that of the ruled. And um, I, I think generally, right, I mean, th this is part of that, the longer Republican tradition. Yeah, you need an informed and aware citizenry yeah. to, to be on the lookout and to, and to call out abuses. Right. And so that would be a benefit of enlighten, enlightenment, right? If it means a more informed citizenry. Yeah. Since we're on that page on the fourth full paragraph, would you explain what he means by the sentence, by prejudice I hear mean not that which renders men ignorant of some particular things, but whatever renders them ignorant of themselves, and by themselves is he referring to their own, uh, what they should have in terms of a rational conception of the world? Or are they, like, what exactly is he trying to say? Yes. Um, yeah, to, I, I think, yeah, ignorant of basically who they are, kind of full human flourishing, um, and then how that relates to government yeah. is the, the two pieces I'd unpack from that. Just kind of weird, worded, strange, is why I want to clear. Right. I mean, and here, I mean, he, that term prejudice will be used in multiple senses in the 18th century, right? Um, later on, Edmund Burke will defend prejudice as kind of pre-existing pre knowledge. Um, someone like Voltaire or the later French Revolution would want to reject all prejudice. And here he's saying, no, no, we want to address what we call negative prejudice, right? Of, um, of, of, of simple ignorance of the human good. Yeah, just because I started to go on on this point, but is it really bad because the whole prejudice literally just means you're prejudging, but you can only judge something before if you have a previous knowledge of it, right? And, and he, but he, here he's suggesting you're prejudging out of ignorance, and that's not, not so good. Whereas, whereas, yeah, I think for a lot of things there has to be prejudgment going on. All right, uh, what's the psychological term when you, uh, heuristics? Mm -hmm. You're fitting it into a pattern. Right, which is how humans have to operate. Yeah. If if you had to rationalize everything, right, you'd you'd be paralyzed. Yeah. And but some of the reformers, that's what they're saying we need to do. Right? Yeah. So, some of these enlightened reformers. Okay, so two two steps from Montesquieu. Then the first one would be how how are how are what what is the character of the right? What's this? What's the spirit of the law? Right, it's the spirit of the law. What's what's the character of the law? What what does law do? And then my follow up question is going to be, how how sh how should it be applied? By that do you mean what he gets into later about these different sort of a reciprocal function of people getting certain characteristics from the laws, but also the the people themselves. Um, instituting laws through whatever hierarchy there is for government mm -hmm. that sort of match their characteristics. I, I think that's part of it, yeah. which, which, uh, which kind of takes him off into the tangents, into some tangents that we didn't read, yeah. right, about he thinks climate might be involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, he thinks the size of the territory governed is involved in that. Yeah. Um, but I think that larger point about laws both emerge from a people and shape a people is, yeah. is really well taken. Yeah, well, um, is it a, is it a major point of his about uh, virtue coming from a republic, honor coming from monarchy, and fear? I believe comes from the despotism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how how major? How major is? That? I'm not I I'm not sure that piece is is major, but he he does observe right. That's part of the scientific. Like he's trying to analyze as far as possible. Okay. I mean, it's pretty fascinating how he establishes his first principles and then derives kind of laws <laughs> from them and so she how it departs from some a lot of the other modern thinkers um so like 34 is pretty much just like it's similar like a recreation 
of, of Hobbes, but like a much different like direction that he takes it with. So um, he's saying like in their state of nature, so like the second paragraph on 34, um, again, their state of nature, um, they'd have the faculty of knowing before any acquired knowledge, so it's kind of like that, probably something similar to that common sense, like innate um, knowledge, but then, and in that state of nature, there's no community, and community only arises from like empirical knowledge and like gain of the senses. Um, so like, again, yeah, uh, which comes later. And then like that's his starting point. And then it's like once we're in society, then there's a need for laws. And then he just kind of breaks down the laws from there. So like he kind of establishes his, his uh, first principle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of nature that's different than a lot of the other modern thinkers. Right. So I mean, it's worth you could you could put this within that same conversation about what what is natural, what is the state of nature. But um, yeah, he's just specifically calling out Hobbes. And what I took from that is is the, the the he says humans desire to live in society, right? They're not forced to. They're not driven to. They desire. They're sociable beings, right? Yeah. Which which will accord well with the Scots as well. They're sociable beings. Well, then, how do you, then what what will cre- what will create and encourage that society further? Yeah, uh, what you addressed there about his, his state of nature it reminds me of slightly of Rousseau. Of course, it's not completely there, but you know, Rousseau and him have this thing in common against Hobbes, saying, "Oh, it's just people fighting each other." Rousseau obviously says, you know, the savage has. No concept of time or death. He, but he's like an animal. He's communal property. He doesn't really care. So he's kind of free in a way. Uh, and for that reason, he doesn't uh, fight yet. And then Montesquieu comes in saying, or they're contemporaries. So I was actually going to ask you about how, what level of conversation those two might have been having. But you know, Montesquieu says uh, they're all just afraid out there in the state of nature. They're not going to fight because they don't. You know, the aggression is going to come out when they join. And uh, similarity with Rousseau, although of course they're very different. So. Right. Um, so what, I wanted to ask, what level of conversation is there between Rousseau and Montesquieu? They do live roughly at the same time, right? Montesquieu's earlier, okay. where, whereas, whereas Rousseau is, is, is slightly later. So I don't think that there's a lot. Do they overlap at all? They may overlap a little okay. bit, but Montesquieu is a very senior writer by that oh, point, okay. and, and, okay. and Rousseau is just coming onto the scene. Okay. So that's why I really did set them apart as phases of thought. Mm-hmm. So I, no, I don't... I'm not aware of that at all. Another question. Oh, sure. How does that state of nature from Montesquieu relate to the founder's state of nature? Um, is, is there, are their views similar? I think, well, on some levels, I think they'd be similar. On others, the, the, this interesting question, how do the founders talk about a state of nature? And I see less of that. I mean, it's an interesting question, mm-hmm. right? Like, even... I, I could do some more reading up on that. Most, most of the founders, again, thinking about constitutional principles, assume men are in society, mm-hmm. right? And that even at the Declaration, they assumed there was a government. Yeah. So, so they're less likely to kind of do state of nature theorizing. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of John Adams. Adams kind of assumes and asserts men living in society. And then goes from there. So they're less likely, I think, again, the exception might be Jefferson, to do a lot of kind of state of nature speculating. Yeah, because we were talking earlier about state of nature improving quality. It seems Jefferson would be one inclined to say that with someone like Montesquieu or like in Aristotle's politics, like we're all equal in the sense that when we're not together, we're kind of out of luck. Mm-hmm. And we have this human rationality that drives us to be social, and then when we're together, being social, we have a greater defense. So the baseline is that rationality and that ability to communicate with, with, by which we understand we're all out of luck if we're not together. That, so that, and I think, yeah, I think Jefferson would, would see that. As some of the others would just say, well, we're together, period. Now let's, now let's move forward as to how we're going to shape that. So we have multiple questions, we'll try to keep them separate. So on page 33, second to last paragraph, uh, even most of them are more attentive than you to self-preservation do not make so bad a use of their passions, referring to animals, basically not wanting to, basically like they, they care more about self-preservation because they don't know they're going to die. 
And wouldn't that be the other way around? Because humans know they're going to die, they're going to make more of an effort to preserve themselves? Or well, it's, I think it, he's just saying it's not, it's not conscious, right? That it's, it's almost in, inborn. So they have instincts, but we don't? That, that their attention to self-preservation is instinctual rather than rational so or will. Rational. But a human is rational. We just don't do a very good job of it. OK. Um, the next page on 34, fourth paragraph, basically, um, he says that domination is not what drives humanity. And then he goes on to say that want is. So is he referring to basically hedonistic pleasures that drives humanity? I don't think, I don't think it's hedon. I think, I think it's, it's necessities of life. Wouldn't one of those be domination, like self-preservation? Uh, yeah, but, but self-preservation would be different than domination. Well, in order to survive, like, you need to kill other animals to eat them and consume them. That's domination, right? Uh, or is he just referring to domination intraspecies level? I think because <coughs> he's commenting on Hobbes. Who right. Dominated. To humans, yeah. right. But then, when you're in the civilized society, if you're not dominating, you're going to make, be dominated by someone else, right? That's your outcome. I mean, there's. Well, I mean, that's 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 Hobbes. I don't, but but Montesquieu would not accept that. Because he would say that we're all. Well, but it, once we're in society, wouldn't he agree with that? Because once you're out of the state of nature, then it's a, then it's a setup of domination. I don't. I don't. I really don't think he he uses beyond that section. I don't think he really discusses that very much. Okay. It's just not a key theme. Because I guess that's something I think of. I mean, obviously, he isn't Rousseau, but um, with Rousseau, <coughs> people are equal. But then once they move into society, the whole point is once you're inside, you're going to be exploited or taken advantage of by other classes, or somebody's going to be on top, right? <laughs> I don't think, again, I don't think that's the, the, the concern he's most trying to s solve. That's going to come in later, later writers. Okay. Uh, I mean, if some, I mean, and there are writers who will recognize even economic domination, which is why you need that mixed system, right? Going back to the Romans, where the, the tribunes spoke up for the, for the plebs. Okay. And then on the, the next page, it basically says, it feels like he's the end for him is knowledge and unifying human kind of, uh, I don't really know what consciousness perhaps, but like is, um, am, I, am I off base here kind of way if I want to know? On, on 35 you see that or? So, kind of, he has the so advantage of acquired knowledge. So it's like from the previous paragraph, besides the sensory instinct that he possesses the common fruits, he has the advantage of acquired knowledge, and that he what then arises a second tie, which is man has a desire to unite. So is that referring to like un unifying all knowledge, or what? No, I I, th I think I see it as you know, the the human reason can be passed along, which then means um, sociability. Okay, so by unification, he means societal sharing, not not full. Yeah, the United just cooperation. I think would be a better wording for that. Okay, thank you. The other purpose, thinking about purposes, right? I wanted to push us along a little bit later than in in Montesquieu. So, two ten, right? He starts talking about liberty. Right. What, what are the aims constructing, right? And obviously, if you look at those page numbers, we jumped a lot. Um, um, even Montesquieu, right? Montesquieu, the guy informing many of the founders, says, political liberty does not consist in unlimited freedom. In governments, that is, in societies directed by laws, liberty can consist only in the power of doing what we ought to will and in not being constrained to do what we ought not to will. So here again, I see this as a relatively uh, positive conception of liberty, right? That it, it should free us to do what we ought, that there is still an ought, 
we ought to will something. We ought to serve others. We ought not to harm others. And is, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is similar to Aristotle, right, where he talks yeah. about freedom not being the ability to do whatever you want, but to basically to be able to do what you should. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I, this is why I'm stressing this, because I see this as continuity. Okay. Um, yeah, whether that's Thomas, whether that's John Winthrop, um, or you know, a lot of a lot of Americans have this. I mean, because this is this is not simply libertarian. Do whatever doesn't harm others. It's no. There is there is there are oughts, and you should be free to follow what you ought to do. Right, that libertarian. That's a that's specific to the Enlightenment. Basically. Yes. Yeah, the, the f just simple freedom from constraint without an ought is an Enlightenment era development. How far would he take what that can be legislated against? I guess because there are, um, so you might obviously like legislate against, um, you know, uh, I, don't know, I guess I'm curious because uh, it, it's a common thread with kind of libertarians, like, oh, I'm personally, you know, against this, or I see this as a moral evil. But, um, you know, people are free to choose what they want to do and whatnot to, like, you know, keep kind of government right. limited so that they don't interfere with those freedoms. Kind of where might he fall on the spectrum? No, I think I think he'd be okay with morals legislation. Maybe not every, you know, maybe. You'd have to argue around the edges, but okay. but he would be okay with that because you know if you're actively harming yourself and others, mm -hmm. and you can show harm, uh, then uh, you ought not to be doing it, and so it could be legislated against. Again, I think that would be subsequent sections. Okay, the final thing I'd want us to see then uh, two thirteen. He's writing of the Constitution of England, right? And it's not simply a descriptive, you know, this, this is what England does. It is a uh, commending the Constitution of England, right? He says, where is liberty embodied best? And his answer is in England. So then he is kind of thinking analytically, what makes it the best, <clears throat> right? Um, you know, they have liberty, they have quietness of mind, um, but why? Because England has separated powers. And again, we say, oh, separation of powers, checks and balances. Again, that's like late elementary school. But for Montesquieu, he's pioneering this analysis. And so he's the one saying the separation of powers, checks and balances is, is a key to liberty. And he's, he's kind of describing it, and he's saying England is doing it the best. And so his recommendation is France should move its, its constitution and its laws in the direction of England. How does that work with um page 212, the general discussion of how different governments are, or basically, sorry, different societies have different governments. Mm -hmm. and it's almost like they have different ends. So it's even, so that the liberty is not a universal then, right? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. I think it goes to that, that character, culture, climate, geography, all of those pieces, um, where he's descriptively saying, you know, they have chosen different ends. But he, I think Montesquieu would still say liberty is, is the best end to strive for. So he wouldn't say that the, um, the Roman, Spartan, or Jewish ends, they're not being domination, religion, and commerce, which he says, but that those are not ends, the societies cannot have their own ends. It's not relative, it has to be. Well, I, th I think he'd be recommending liberty, right? But, but you're right, not everybody loves liberty. The, the love of liberty is not an, an inherent or a given, even though he's saying it's, it's, it's best and it's good. Okay, Peter. Yeah, so this idea, you said that he is kind of revolution, revolutionizing the analysis of the Constitution of England, which I'm sure is true in England's case, but isn't the idea of sort of separate powers that would go back to Aristotle's politics? Fair enough. 
Fair enough. I'm not saying, obviously, of course, Aristotle did not have the Constitution of England at his disposal to analyze, but I'm, but it's just like, is the, this idea, it seems like it's not nothing new, like the Romans had it. The, 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 the Romans have it in, in practice, mm -hmm. right? But what Montesquieu is doing is he's providing a 18th century analysis right. of it, and it, so it's, it's his analysis that gets, gets taken up by people thinking about yeah, it. So yeah, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Greek historian who wrote an account of mm -hmm. Rome and the system of government, and even I think Aristotle and the politics has a discussion of the three branches. Right, of right, so. right. But what, what what I'm saying is 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 Montesquieu is you know bringing that forward and, and giving an right. explanation of it. But yeah, you're, it's it's not exactly new. so. The payoff, though, is, huh? These all guys, these guys might all be onto something, <laughs> right? Let's listen to these voices, not just um, the ancients and the Montesquieu is is, is repeating it. Okay, is it David? Um, similar to what Nathan was talking about on two twelve and the uh, kind of different examples he gives, is he saying that? The, like so, they all have the same end of preservation, and then the the distinctions he gives between his examples are those also ends or means like to the general end of preservation? Because I I more read it that way, and um, yeah, I guess that ties into also what Nathan was bringing earlier of like is domination you know necessary for self preservation or not? And maybe some of the examples like more militaristic society or something it would be, but perhaps, unless you, I mean, just define domination in different ways, but I don't know. <clears throat> so I, it, that was just a tail end thought that popped up. I mean, I, I read that he says, you know, they, the, everyone has the end of preservation and then yet they each have an additional end. Okay. So it's preservation and some way to get there. Or, or some. So is it like we all have the same end and then of preservation, and then we see like an additional end that's particular to each of us, or is it there's our end of preservation, and the way to get there is through these different ways in each society? I think it's the, f the first formulation. Okay. I think it's the first formulation. It's the way I read it. Okay. John? Could you quickly clarify? Because <coughs> in my mind, I'm comparing this with France. So, what was the government structure of France before was it just a monarch? Did they have a sort of legislative body? And then what was it after the revolution? Was right. It just the people? So when when Montesquieu is writing, France is near the height of its absolutist monarchy phase. Mm -hmm. So he would say, I mean he could never say this in public, but he would say this no wonder France does not celebrate liberty like England does because its power is controlled by the absolute monarch who then uh, largely also controls the courts and the, the voice of the people through the, um, through the, through the parlements, which is somewhat different, not exactly, or the estates, right, the estates general, um, is, is silenced. Right. This this is the remarkable thing is that after Louis, I think the thirteenth, dissolves the Estates General, it doesn't meet again for over a hundred years, until 1789 when they try to bring it back, and then it was like, what are we doing? And they have to make it up again. Um, and so, that's um, that's the condition under which Montesquieu is writing. So his his recommendation would be. The, the king should be releasing power so that you have multiple s centers of power so that they can check and balance each other, okay? The, the first constitution in the French Revolution, and this is kind of looking towards our French Revolution topics, but the, the first um, version worked to do that. It kept an assembly, it kept the king, as a constitutional monarch, very weak constitutional monarch, but a constitutional monarch, um, so it did separate powers. The problem there was that Louis the Sixteenth refused to abide by it. 
Right. So it's like this is this is imperfect, but maybe it could have created some stability. Sure. But but he was unwilling to accept those limitations on on his monarchical powers. And then after it was just the legislative. And and then this is the problem is once you literally cut off the king's head, what do you do next? Right. So it's just then one version of of some sort of assembly or executive after another. And you know, then and then you have the the Jacobins are controlling things with the Committee of Public Safety, and then that's transformed into a directory of five, and that's overthrown by Napoleon. So singular rule reasserts itself. Good. Okay, so I wanted us to see this in Montesquieu because I think this is interesting and as an enlightenment perspective, this is actually a, a healthy perspective that, again, the American framers use, okay? Let's go, uh, let's go to America, to the, to the revolution. Um, if people wanted um, John Witherspoon, right, Dominion of Providence, um, 1776, I, I wanted to use this one uh, to show what might a uh, pro-revolutionary but also deeply Christian reflection look like. So starts starts on it's the 529 John John Witherspoon. So. May 17th, 1776, so you know, two months before independence. Um, and let's just observe, the first half is largely uh, the doctrine of providence, right? It's, it's very, he's, he's preaching from the text, it's, it's very straightforward um, to say how does God overrule situations, right? He says in all situations God is overruling. In other words, this is a very reformed notion of providence. Providence isn't just doesn't just pop up in certain points. God is ruling both in good circumstances and bad circumstances. It's only later on that he begins to apply this and to say, he says, you know, I don't usually preach politics from the pulpit, but he says this gives us an opportunity to reflect on what uh, the nation is doing and, and how we should respond. So I'd especially direct us to the, kind of the second half, and I guess I'd say, what's, what's the application or what's, what's the takeaway and how does that reveal um, a take that's maybe different than a Jeffersonian take? Um, I unfortunately don't have the reading with me, so I don't, don't really say it's word for word, but wasn't it basically something along the lines of connecting with the Christian virtues? And that was, I get what those were exactly, but um, because it was because you have like a smaller government, a local government, people, it's more if you don't have the people, it would be, um, uh, people would have more of an incentive to uh, worship God. Yeah, right, kind of off here. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, I think one of the, the key takeaways is that necessity of virtue. In, in the citizens, uh, that it's, uh, you know, liberty requires virtue, that sense, but the best virtue comes from Christians. So um, one version, um, 554, um, what follows from this? He is the best friend to American liberty who is most sincere and active in promoting true and undefiled religion, and who sets himself with the greatest firmness to bear down profanity and immorality of every, any kind. Whoever is an avowed enemy to God, I scruple not to call him an enemy to his country." Right. So Christians are not only good citizens, they're the best citizens. And they have then the language and the ability to address things like uh, duty, uh, self-sacrifice, endurance, um, 
556 frugalness, right? If in times of war you need to deny yourself for the common good, and that's, that's what Christians can do. So those would be uh, key kind of visions. Again, American liberty is about virtue. It's about doing what one ought to do and not doing what one ought not to do. It's not American liberty is doing whatever you want. And so I, I see that, that continuity here in Witherspoon again. Right? This, this is a classically Christian conception of liberty. And it's, it's still present, and, and it's still what's, I think, being preached. And that's why it's really worth noting. So that kind of, well, we, we talked earlier about the medieval Thomistic idea that freedom is just freedom from sin. Is there a, with this reading, and I get like, I don't have it in front of me, but with this, uh, I, I don't want to say this is a revolution or a turning away from something that never was before, but the virtue that liberty promotes that Montesquieu talks about, this is more conducive to a fuller Christian than one who is living underneath something that guides his every thought. Um, it was the general. Now, relating to Jefferson, there's still a bit of guiding Christian virtue in that people, but the difference between that and a, and a, a pre-enlightenment, understand, pre-enlightenment understanding is that this lib- the virtue that comes from this liberty makes a fuller Christian than one living under a, a, you know, divinely stamped monarch. It, it, it does go to that, what, where the, where's the value of liberty? Mm-hmm. Um, that there is a value in, uh, a, or a, yeah, a moral benefit of, of choosing to do, to be virtuous. And I think they are recognizing that. Mm-hmm. So, the, so that would be, that might be a development. I'd, I'd be willing to consider that. Sorry, as an aside, um, would you, uh, that, when I generally hear about the founding, it's generally from libertarians who mm-hmm. have that NAP idea. So um, would you kind of, like what, what examples would you say these people have as their best case evidence from the founding era to make their claim about that, that, that liberty was viewed as being allowed to do whatever you want? So, so what, what would be the counter-argument? Or the, like, wait, what evidence would they use? Like, what documents would they point to? What documents would be, would be available? You know, I'm, I'm tempted to, I mean, to, you, I mean, I think you might find it in pain a little bit. You might find it in Jefferson about just the, the desire for a lack of constraint. Okay. Um, but... Again, that's the who, who are you listening to and why is it that you, you have these competing notions of freedom? I actually think um, the, greater, um, the, the greater weight is on this doing what, doing what is right. The liber- liberty is, is robust and, and ordered to an end. I actually think that's the majority. Now you can find some others. Um, you can definitely find counter voices, but I think they're, they're lesser. Some of this uh, libertarian and uh, libertarian interpretation of the American founding come in part from the Bill of Rights as well. You know, especially with the Second Amendment, I think is the I think is the real flashpoint for uh, libertarians and you know free speech as well, mm-hmm. a big one. But then also just like freedom from government interference and things that also partly because where they look at the Bill of Rights and they say. Ah, uh, yes, we have the rights to do this because the Bill of Rights says we do. So. Right, and, 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 and so the, I think the historical response would be those, those rights are, are, you know, growing our balance. There are also duties, right? We don't have a Bill of Duties, but, but rights always carry with them duties. And, and so um, enumerating rights is not simply, you know, it's only about rights. Rights are always... Weight and balance. Like this idea that you know we have free speech, but as a result, then we have a responsibility to, you know, use that in the correct way. To to speak truth, not to cry fire in a crowded building. Yeah, have, and like uh, you know, we have the right to bear arms, but we only have the rights to use our weapons in 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 certain ways. Right. So obviously, we can't go out and, uh, and uh, shoot up a building. That would be. We're not firing down a street. Right. 
we're not endangering others. Right. So that's like, right. So that that's that's kind of the sort of like the historical argument against this libertarian interpretation is that these sort of rights are contingent. On, I don't know if I'm going to say contingent, but these rights carry with them certain duties Correct. that the libertarians don't seem to give you. You don't want to. They have not recognized that that there are duties. That, their their rights are not untrammeled, and see that the the other piece is what's the circle. Right. If we're now, if we're now you know um, criticizing libertarians, um, it's not just about the individual, right? It's also about the community in which the individual lives, and about how an individual's actions affect other people. So, kind of, I th I think what they're doing is they're taking the extreme, extreme Lockean or extreme Jeffersonian position of the the contracting individual. And saying that's that's all there is. So these like these militia groups, like for example, the three percenters, um, Appalachia, who are just kind of a nutty libertarian right wing militia, and claim they're kind of named themselves after the three percent of Americans who took up arms against the British during the Revolution. Is that sort of thing based off of a rights libertarian centered? Likely. Founding? Likely. <laughs> Likely. That it's you know it's 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 I mean, and there's that you know individuals do have choices and individuals have you know have rights and need to be protected and can combine to do that, but it's it also needs to be again that that balance, it, the individual in the community and and I think that's where I would want to push to restore that that greater community emphasis, Brian. Uh, Dr. Ellie mentioned earlier the um, sort of the the religious denominational differences. And their views of that, how it might, and I'm not to be like cynical, but how it might uh, influence the views of government. Speaking as a Presbyterian pastor, uh, would he have an interest in that more strictly Republican uh, structure as opposed to something more Hamiltonian? Because something more Hamiltonian could potentially become sort of a Protestant kingdom. I, I know Hamilton's sort of monarch, it's just sort of a lifelong president. Right. But I guess my question is is that a genuine fear that? If the federal government gets too big, it would impact religion in a way that it would in England, or would people? So, so that is a fear. The irony is that the target of that fear in 1787 were the Presbyterians, uh -huh. uh, not 1776, but but 1787. Um, so. When people looked around, they said, boy, if this new government creates a national church, it might be a Presbyterian church. Huh. And so it's the Presbyterians who are coming from that state church tradition of Scotland. When they meet, they actually meet, it's, it's a great story, 1787 in Philadelphia, yeah. at the same time that the Constitutional Convention is going on. John Witherspoon is just down the street in Philadelphia at the, at the Presbyterian National Convention. And they go on record as saying religious liberty is a greater good than a national really? church. There's no Oliver Cromwell energy among them. No. Man. <laughs> now, to some extent, they know they have to do this to protect their reputation. Mm. Um, but but the, from that point on, Presbyterians are along, along with every other denomination are advocating for the religious liberty. And so then you do create this kind of religious marketplace of lots of different denominations. Oh, I know. That's, that's really interesting. But that, that type of ideal can coexist with an ideal of religious liberty, right? Oh. That, that, that religious liberty is the good to be protected because then each individual in each church can follow their conscience yeah. in, in achieving their eternal ends. So that, I, I'm circling back to religious liberty is yeah. um, is justified out of a religious concern. It's it's not simply an enlightenment secularizing principle, right? Yeah. The the First Amendment has has a religious good behind it. Yeah, that's another very important balancing. We were talking about earlier again the anti enlightenment track. You have these very religious about people seeing this as greater for the furtherance of religion. And, and so the, the, um, the story of what happens then at the state level of state churches is that very often the cooperation of 
many Christians, as well as some people who are more enlightenment, who agree together that religious liberty is a good thing. The best example is Virginia, right? So yes, James Madison is working for religious liberty in Virginia, and yes, Thomas Jefferson writes the bill that ultimately gets passed for religious liberty, but the energy and the support for it comes from a number of Christian denominations. Both, well, Methodists, Baptists, and Presbyterians all largely support the, the move to, to religious liberty in Virginia. Episcopalians, I um, They're a little bit quieter. Yeah, I think they, they would have preferred some, well, they, theirs was the church being disestablished, so they had a, they had a valid reason to, to not be so thrilled with that idea. Okay, David, and back to Jack. I was just going to respond to Brian, but also um, it's in Aquinas too, with like liberty and the bonum precept of <coughs> being able to pursue the good as like each person you know, can see fit. And so even like before the Enlightenment, like the, the idea of religious liberty is still, you know, it's present within, you know, I mean, it's in Catholicism, but also I think other uh, Christian denominations later. Um, in a very different in a, in a different yeah, yeah well yeah uh, exactly but I'm saying but like the, the actual idea or kernel of it um, is present yeah I'd be curious yeah you could explore that idea more because I mean I'm not yeah uh, I'm not one to look at like the medieval ages as tyrannical but I also I don't think they would have uh, you know I'm not saying that they would they wouldn't have had the concepts of like complete religious freedom within a kingdom they would have, I think a Thomistic answer would be, no, that's typically not a good thing. I think, yeah, I, I don't think they would have, you know, wanted a, a pluralistic society, but they would have seen the need for it had the, you know, had, like, there, had they, like, I guess, like, lived in one or something like that, because that, that precept is, is embedded in there. Yeah, but well, well, what? Correct us if I'm correct me if I'm wrong here. But what? In the Thomistic view, once a religious kingdom is established, it's not generally not a good thing to disestablish the correct. Top -down yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think this is an American contribution yeah. to to thought and to religious operation. And again, I, I, I do think it it brings uh, that soul liberty, the more authentic yeah. faith. On the other hand, it. Full disestablishment, does, if, you, if you really have to follow the First Amendment, that Congress shall make no law respecting any establishment of religion, yeah. it does raise the question of where does Christianity fit yeah. in that? Yeah. What, what does no establishment of any religion mean? And in fact, this is argued over, I think, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Yeah. But I, I don't think it has to lead to kind of a secularist interpretation, although that's what the way the courts have gone, especially after World War II. Yeah, and to mm -hmm. get to your point about Aquinas, I think he has like three essays, or um, not essays, but articles in the Summa. Mm -hmm. And he says, why should we allow Jews, or should or should we not allow Jews, and why should or should we not allow pagans, and why, and then heretics. And the reasons he gives are very, he's like, we should allow the Jews because they prefigure Christ, so they're helpless to explain it. We should allow pagans insofar as it's, if, if the law cannot uh, expediently sort of sequester them, and then heretics, he says, no, they're a no-go as long as you have authority. Not that you would get rid of the people who are misled by the heretic, mm -hmm. but they would have a process for, you're a heretic, respond, you responded, okay, now there's a penalty. So I don't know how similar the American religious liberty concept would be with the Thomistic. And the, you know, the eternal tension with it is like, how far do you let liberty go? before it's like you know pressing on someone else's liberty and so i yeah. wonder if that is kind of in the back of his mind within you know heretics within a society and like how how much of a detriment to societies are they would they bring in order to you know mock allow them to you know well for aquinas, or, for aquinas it wouldn't be pressing against my liberty it'd be pressing against yeah. the true religion yeah which would have a detrimental effect on society yeah I would say I don't think I've read those articles, but I should because those in the Summa because that, those sound like really interesting yeah, discussions. I think, yeah, I think the titles rather there's just numbers. I could, I'll yeah, send my professor an email and ask him which what numbers. Yeah, that would that would be fascinating because that, that actually would be worth reading. He does want Jews, pagans, and heretics.
and he explains, you know. Jack, you've been waiting. No, um, that was fascinating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, did some of the, you know, religi the religions that had a confession of faith, did, did any of those religions immediately welcome kind of a pluralistic society? Or, because I heard, I've heard some denominations kind of had to so-called, I guess, amend their confession of faith, like... Uh, the Presbyterians, this, yeah. that, that's the direct application of yeah. this. So did they amend their confession of faith after this whole outbreak, or did they amend it before? Uh, well, so the, the, it is the Presbyterian, right, because in coming from Scotland with the yeah. state church, that's, that was kind of built in, that their, their goal throughout colonial America was to celebrate godly magistrates with an established church and it's in 1787 when they dis when they change that okay. in in a court well be, this, that's before the first amendment so they're not the first amendment isn't forcing them but but in the new nation they're recognizing that's a good thing okay the um anglicans slash episcopalians um don't don't kind of go along with that willingly they kind of are, I mean, in the South, they're the ones who are being disestablished. Okay, so they kind of do it, but kicking and screaming? Protesting, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So, I mean, it's, it's a process, right, of, you know, the First Amendment says the federal government will not establish a church. It says nothing about the states. And so there are many established state churches, even when the First Amendment goes into effect in 1790, um, and the last one doesn't disestablish until 1833. It's Massachusetts. And that's, that's what I find so fascinating is um, that uh, New England, the other New England states were late as well. Connecticut, New Hampshire. I think it was New Hampshire, then Connecticut. Um, so clearly the First Amendment didn't disturb them. And in fact, look, when you look at the debates in those states, they're not referencing the First Amendment. They're referencing the the kind of preconditioned questions about what 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 does liberty entail um, more than that. So they're not saying, oh, the First Amendment, therefore, no, nobody is saying that. The First Amendment has no bearing on these state discussions. Hmm. And they're also almost, they also never quote Jefferson in the debates. Sometimes they'll quote Madison, but never quote Jefferson, which is one more reason I'm, you know, questioning his influence. So to clarify that point, so legalistically, the First Amendment would only apply to federal territories like D.C. as an example, but it would not apply to the state. So meaning if I live in Minnesota and Minnesota had a Lutheran church as a state church and I wasn't a Lutheran, the state of Minnesota could do things to me because I'm not a Lutheran. Uh, un under, under the 19th century, operation, yes. Now, now subsequently, uh, the First Amendment, after the 14th Amendment, First Amendment has been incorporated, mm -hmm. which means if Minnesota today, not that it would, but wanted to establish the Lutheran Church, you know, ELCA of America of Minnesota, they could not do that. And that's because today, after 1868, federal laws Const constitutional protections of individual rights apply in the, to the state level. Right. Now, I, I, I've actually had debates with law professors that maybe this shouldn't be the case, but I think I've lost those debates. So, so that's that's my understanding. I mean, no one, no one, no one's in danger of like reestablishing something in. Minnesota or yeah, Nebraska. The biggest chance to happen would be Utah with the Mormons. Not that it matters, but well, and and of course there there were huge battles over Utah over more over Mormonism's political status in the 1890s, right. which which resulted in the Supreme Court ruling that they had to be basically curtailed. Yeah. Uh, society. What's that? That was the, the Reynolds versus USA mm -hmm. case. It was polygamy means detrimental society, so that's where they curtail religious liberty. Right. Well, now they have a special God that tells them that, not, that it's monogamy now, so I guess they could do it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't keep up. <laughs> also, <laughs> more big auction. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's changing all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, the incorporation debate, you, it, it, you get into this. I think what most people don't understand about incorporation is, well, if you want to de-incorporate or incorporate different amendments, like the conservative states' rights person would, who didn't understand incorporation yet would be shocked to, to find out that that means the state can take your guns away because it's only the you know, pre-incorporation. Pre it's just saying the federal government can't do this. So it, it, unless, unless there was a matching Bill of Rights in the state. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it seems to be sort of, it affects different areas across the partisan split, and it's not really in anyone's interest to deincorporate, start mm -hmm. that trend. Not that it would happen. But I don't know. I, I, I'd be willing to consider that question. How many states have a Bill of Rights? Almost all of the original state constitutions had something that, which, which was why the absence in the federal constitution caused so much consternation. Because they said, it's, if it's good enough at the state level, why isn't it good enough at the federal level? And then, of course, it's Madison who writes them up and maneuvers them through Congress and gets them approved. So, Speaking of Madison, this, this might be, so we also had, and maybe not everybody got this, but uh, Federalist 10 and 51. Um, these are classics. Maybe, maybe since you'll probably encounter them elsewhere, we won't linger with them except to say, what are they? You know, this is political science dealing with things like faction, right? The problem of faction. How do you curtail faction? Um, and the, his Republican answer is separation of powers again and checks and balances. So the the connection, the continuity, might be. If Montesquieu is saying, you know, liberty arises as you separate powers and, and check the, the uses of them, then Madison is, uh, put, is arguing for a similar idea and saying this is a very Republican ideal that will uh, help create liberty under the proposed federal constitution. So it remind me, is 10 the one about faction, or is 10 the one where he says, um, we're blessed to have this United Nation, United Language, People, Culture, etc.? Uh, no, United, United Country is two, especially. Okay. Ten, 10 is faction. Okay, thank you. 10 is faction, 51 is checks and balances. And of course, 51 also has one of my favorite passages, which is, you know, uh, if men were angels, no laws would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, no, re no restraints would be necessary. But, but neither of those are true. Therefore, we have to both create a government that can, you know, legislate for the people and also force it to control itself. Right? You need, you need both of those pieces.